Hey, this episode is available in audio only podcast format. And also on that channel, I have some audio exclusives on some episodes that you might find interesting too. Link to that is in the description below. Heat stroke, the most fatal extreme weather event. Heat stroke affects people of all ages. Heat stroke, is it actually a stroke? And heat stroke can be caused by the body generating heat or the environment not allowing someone to release that heat. I recently reported a Bitcoin miner who had heat stroke in his sleep and his organs shut down. He ran multiple computers in a room, graphics cards overclocked, fans running on high, and all of it was generating a lot of heat. Suddenly, during a heat wave, the patient didn't realize how hot it was in his room. He wasn't ready for it because he hadn't installed his window AC units. He slowly became dehydrated. The room was hot and his body couldn't cool down. He heat stroked in his sleep one night and suffered permanent minor brain damage. This was reported on an image board and people took it as a joke and maybe it is, but the same person allegedly responded to a blog at the time named Bitcoin Mining Accidents and told his story. And there's enough specifics in there about heat stroke that regular folks wouldn't know about unless they had experienced it themselves. So it's more likely to be real than not, but we're never gonna know for sure because internet. Simple details tell you exactly when this happened because there was really only a narrow time window when people could actually mine Bitcoin themselves. Today, you need very specialized computers to do it and you also need cheap electricity because Bitcoin network consumes lots of energy. I found some sources saying that it consumes as much energy as some small European countries, and it also creates a lot of heat. So that needs a lot of cooling, which means even more electricity. So in some cases, it's done in really cold places. So what is Bitcoin and why did it drive this behavior? Well, Bitcoin is a decentralized cryptocurrency and it started running in January 2009. It's a computer program and people have tokens called Bitcoin that they can send to one another through the Bitcoin network where computers running the software can observe, confirm, and write these transactions to a public ledger called the blockchain. So every computer running the program Bitcoin has a copy of the blockchain, which has every single transaction that's happened on the network since January 3rd, 2009. It represents digital scarcity because only 21 million coins will ever be minted with the number entering circulation getting cut in half about every four years. That's a hard rule that's built into the system. It represents value because people use it to pay for goods and services. They can send it directly from one person to another through the internet while the transaction becomes of public record. The computers that help confirm those transactions are miners because every block of transactions attached to the blockchain the Bitcoin network rewards newly minted coins. In the early days when individuals could do the mining from their own computers, people were trying to outdo one another. It was a race and the fastest computers would get the most rewards. So what did people do? They built bigger computers. They started chaining graphics cards together. They started chaining systems together. And the bigger these systems got, the more electricity they used, the more heat they generate because they were running at near maximum 24 seven. There was a lot of money to be made, even back then, and anyone who held onto their coins from those early days when they were worth under 100 US dollars, well, the price of one coin hasn't dropped under $3,000 since 2018. So this brings us to the problem of heat. If individuals were doing this mining and their computers were running dangerously hot without necessary precautions, you're asking for trouble. And we have evidence of this. There used to be a blog called Bitcoin Mining Accidents that ran in those early days. And this brings us to the Bitcoin miner who heat stroked in his sleep. So with anything that's posted on the internet, the original post was much more visible than the alleged follow-up. The original reading posted to an image board in June, 2011, I'm done with Bitcoin. It was easy money, but it wasn't worth the literal heat. Had four machines with multiple overclocked 5850s in my bedroom. Fan speeds at 100%. Room was warm, but tolerable. Weather suddenly gets hotter one day. Get severe heat stroke while sleeping. Get taken to the ER. Get covered in bags of ice and drink tons of Gatorade and water. Finally cool down after what seemed like forever. Find out that I have permanent minor brain damage now because my brain was too hot and swelled a lot. I wish I was joking. Is this real? Maybe. Probably, actually. Is it possible? 100%. Many of the responses in the thread made jokes that the miner already had brain damage before the heat stroke. Others asked how he wouldn't have known that his body was hot. How can you possibly stay in a room and get a body temperature so high that your brain becomes damaged? Others said he may have had physical features that would cause him to heat stroke like this, like diabetes and obesity. All of these could be legitimate questions and comments, but the situation itself 
could also be legitimate too. Heat waves kill more people on average than any other extreme weather event. That's data on record from the US National Weather Service, and anyone who's practiced in an emergency room in any big city, you see this happening every summer. But how exactly does heat stroke do damage? Aren't human bodies adapted to variations in climate? Well, we are, but keep in mind, if heat is in the body causing problems, then the problems show up when the body is making too much heat, or the body can't get rid of heat. Making too much heat is called exertional heat stroke, and comes from overexertion, like doing extreme workouts in 100 degree weather, or a farmer working in the fields when it's 110 degrees outside, or being a firefighter fighting an actual fire, or someone taking something at a rave because that stimulant turns someone's body into a furnace. But that can also happen with some regular medicines that some people would take too. Body can't get rid of heat, that's called classic heat stroke. And it's a little bit different than exertional because it happens to people who are either in too hot of environment, like the Bitcoin miner, but it can also happen to people who can't sweat. Who can't sweat? Well, some diabetics can't because they have decreased sweat gland innervation, and in the body there's an increased temperature threshold for cutaneous vasodilation, so that predisposes those patients to heat stroke. And classic heat stroke can happen in someone with other underlying illnesses too. When excess heat is present in the body, it might not matter whether it's generated or accumulated, because the pathophysiology of disease is about the same. Heat stress in the body leads to an increased metabolic rate in cells. This increases core body temperature, which the body tries to mitigate through sweat. Water is the ideal medium to do this because its specific heat is so high. Most of our body is made of water too, and for most healthy people in normal situations, this thermoregulatory feedback loop finishes here. That excess heat is dissipated through sweat, and then everything is fine. But say something happens and more heat than expected is present. Cardiac output is going to increase. This will increase skin blood flow as an attempt to dissipate heat. But if more blood goes to the skin, less blood is going to go to the organs. The body's not gonna make a bunch more blood suddenly. So the body can still compensate for these changes because of heat, but only up to a certain point. When central venous pressure, that's as the blood returning back to the heart, starts to decrease, this pathway enters a non-compensable feed-forward phase, and this is where heat stroke starts. Less circulation to the viscera means increased core body temperature. Remember, water has a high specific heat, and less flow overall means that the organs can't cool down. And one of the first organs to go, because it's so sensitive to heat, is the brain. I mean, it is called heat stroke, after all. And a stroke is any time when the brain can't get enough oxygen. Could be from a clot, or a bleed, or from the body becoming like a furnace, burning up the whole thing. And central nervous system disturbances are universal in heat stroke. They always happen. And the data shows that consciousness is usually regained after the body temperature falls below 105 degrees Fahrenheit, which is 40.5 Celsius. But how and why does it happen? Well. Excess heat causes the proteins of the blood-brain barrier to become more permeable. We know it happens, and it could be an attempt to dissipate heat, or it could be the proteins themselves in that blood-brain barrier denaturing, among other mechanisms. But the final result means that more substances can enter the brain. Which substances exactly? Well, it looks like proteins and pathogens. But these aren't what seem to cause the encephalopathy and neurologic impairments. It looks like increased intracranial pressure and autonomic dysfunction cause these problems. This was shown in post-mortem analyses that found brain edema and patches of congestion and pedicyl hemorrhages. But also found in these was neuron degeneration in the cerebellum and cerebral cortex. But exactly how that happens, we're not sure. And this is what happened to the Bitcoin miner. And actually, from retrospective data, those who have this kind of brain damage also tend to have higher mortality too. Since the Bitcoin miner is young, the case in my video, he was 23, but the person actually posting allegedly was a college freshman, so we're looking at 18 to 19 years old. We don't actually know if his chances of dying really increased, but to give you an example, there was an inhaler with long-acting beta agonists called LABAs that reportedly increased the risk of asthma-related death. But a second analysis of a larger data set published in 2018 showed that there isn't an increase in the risk of death. But the story of heat stroke doesn't just end with the brain. It doesn't just end with altered consciousness. That's only the beginning. Disseminated intravascular coagulation, that is a bleeding and clotting disorder, 
quickly happens. Respiratory distress comes in as hypotension and hypoperfusion set in. Remember, as the body tries to dissipate heat by surfacing the blood to the skin, less blood goes to the organs. Remember, this is the start of the non-compensable feed-forward phase as central venous pressure drops. Then the acute kidney dysfunction starts to happen. GI and liver dysfunction starts to set in. Pathology samples from animal experiments show hemorrhage with vascular congestion thrombosis, and also the presence of inflammatory cells, which means the immune system is somehow activated in the setting of heat stroke. Heat stroke definitely does set off inflammation. Interferons, which are signaling proteins, are activated and immune cells start to swarm around in the body. This makes sense from a very superficial level. Protein messengers are responsible for activating the immune system. That's what interferons are, they're proteins. What happens to proteins when heat is applied? Well, they start to denature and they fold differently. That could make them not work at all. Excess heat in the body, if it's not cooled down in time, will cause inflammation, leukocytosis, coagulopathy, very possibly from protein denaturing. And what exactly happens in that coagulopathy? Well, tiny little blood clots lodge into the microvasculature. That's the small, narrow blood vessels that supply blood to the organs get blocked. Then the organs start to starve of oxygen, causing tissue ischemia without enough oxygen from this blockage and from the redirection of blood to the skin, cells start to die in a way that trigger the immune system to react, which will damage the organs too. As widespread microthrombosis sets in, other parts of the organs will start to bleed, causing hemorrhage, all as the organs start to shut down. And there's already hints to how this affects the heart. Because blood is redirected to the skin to help dissipate heat, the central venous pressure is lowered. That's the trigger that causes the non-compensable phase. Lower CVP and decreased diastolic filling will get the heart to try to compensate by increasing cardiac output by increasing contractility to maintain stroke volume. This stress caused by additional heat can result in syncope, so someone fainting or passing out. And it can lead to orthostasis, that sometimes when you stand up, the field of vision starts to go dark. And this all happens without considering people who are already taking medicines. What do you think happens to a 70 year old woman who's on three blood pressure medications and she has diabetes and she's having a heat stroke? Tachycardia and hypotension come from non-compensable phase. And on the ECG, you're gonna see polyventricular complexes, ST segment depression, T wave changes consistent with myocardial ischemia because the heart isn't getting enough blood. And what else can impact the heart? Electrolyte disturbances. And one of the concepts that unifies classic and exertional heat stroke is the energy balance equation. That is, the accumulation of heat in the body can come from the body itself making too much heat too quickly, or the body isn't necessarily making extra heat, it just can't dissipate it because something in the surrounding environment is too hot. And in both of these cases, sweat is that compensation. Water has that high specific heat. And even if outside environment is warmer than the body temperature, you're still okay if you can sweat. But during times like extreme exercise, people can lose up to three liters of water an hour. And I always laughed at that expression that some high school coaches do to their students. They used to say, your workout wasn't good enough unless you can wring out the sweat from your shirt afterwards. No. That's such an easy way to burn out athletes. And let's say you do work out and you do practice for three hours a day and you sweat and then you lose out nine liters of water. That's almost two and a half gallons. Are you gonna replenish that through the day? Maybe, there's a good chance you're probably not. And if you do miss out on that and then you do another three hour practice the next day and then you lose another nine liters of sweat, are you gonna drink five gallons of water to have kept that up? How about if you do it again the day after and the day after that? You're gonna see how this dehydration is going to start to catch up. Sometimes you lose mostly water with sweat and if that's the case, well, sodium is the predominant extracellular cation. And if total body water decreases, the sodium concentration is going to increase. So that's hypernatremia. Because water follows sodium, that means that water would leave the brain to compensate. And so to fight that, the brain will try to get more water in, which can lead to brain edema. And this is in addition to the brain edema that would happen due to the excess heat, increasing the permeability of the blood-brain barrier. Sometimes you do lose sodium with the sweat, then you have hyponatremia. And if you lose a lot of sodium, but it's still present in your cells, then water flows into the cells, causing brain edema too. You could also sweat out potassium too, which would cause hypokalemia. And because potassium is used to signal muscle relaxation and the heart is a muscle that could add more to the cardiac instability. 
Also, for exertional heat stroke, the muscles can actually break off and become damaged because, well, you're overexerting yourself. You're tearing the muscles apart as you're pushing or pulling, and that's generating massive amounts of heat. And remember, muscles are protein too, and the extra heat will cause it all to denature. And those proteins, well, they're gonna go into the kidneys and they're gonna gunk up the tubules and they're gonna cause permanent kidney damage. But that's specific to exertional heat stroke and rhabdomyolysis doesn't typically happen in classic heat stroke. And how about the GI tract? Well, we've known for decades that gut ischemia can increase epithelial permeability. It was reported in long distance runners suffering from exertional heat stroke back in the 80s. The mechanism for how it could happen were described in the early 2000s and multiple case reports were published describing endotoxemia, intestinal barrier dysfunction, and gut perforation, all happening in the setting of hyperthermia and heat stroke. We know that there's less blood going to the organs in heat stroke. This could include the GI tract too. Clots form in the microvasculature. Tissue hypoxia reduces ATP production in the mitochondria, generating reactive oxygen species and nitric oxide. The reason why this is unique is because of what is inside the GI tract. Water goes into the kidneys, but bacteria doesn't float around in the blood normally. The fluids that go to the brain are also sterile. But in the GI tract, you have lots of bacteria that helps digest foods. And as those leak out, it results in endotoxemia. So how do you treat this? Well, the easiest and the most obvious answer in this case is just to cool down the patient's body. And how do you do that? You can do it with ice packs. You can also fan the patient while spraying their body with water until their core temperature decreases. The latter kind of emulates sweating, and you want to do this quickly. The prognosis worsens if the body temperature is above 104.9 Fahrenheit, which is 40.5 Celsius. Although, if you're going to dump cold ice water suddenly on somebody, expect them to react negatively, regardless of a heat stroke or not. There isn't a medicine that you can use to lower body temperature, and thank goodness, because I don't think that that would actually help. So the treatment here, specifically for heat stroke, is just to cool the person down. This is heat stroke, not fever. So giving Tylenol, paracetamol, in this case, would not help the patient. Actually, it might do worse for their liver. And if the patient is dehydrated, rehydrate them. The treatment is simple, even though understanding why heat stroke causes the problems that it does is still something that's being researched. And to the Bitcoin miner who heat stroked, he mentioned the CNS disturbances as they were happening, confusion and hallucination. He got out of his room and told his parents that he didn't feel well, and they knew enough to at least bring him to the emergency room. It turned out he was okay after getting cooled down, although he did say that a head CT in the ED showed minor brain damage. I'm surprised that they saw that on imaging so quick. Maybe he really did have brain damage beforehand. We don't really know. But they may have been referring to the edema, which would cause damage later, as the atrophy appears to be progressive after the initial heat stroke. So Bitcoin has actually changed a lot since this time in 2011. People can't mine the coin themselves anymore. Back then, the price topped out at around $30 a coin and then dropped down to like $2 a coin later that year. But today, we've seen Bitcoin become $19,000 for a single coin. It's hovering around 11,000 today in 2020. But back then, there weren't other coins around. And now there's so many other coins that people can't even keep track of them. And it's strange to think that in 2011, that was really so long ago now, that it's all a part of history. Thanks so much for watching. Take care of yourself and be well.